I'm Andrew Kitley, and this is my podcast, The Invisible Gift, a show about turning disability into possibility. From a young age, I was told I had a disability that would make it impossible for me to achieve and flourish in life. I struggled in school and felt I was not truly understood or supported. On my long road to becoming the owner of multiple businesses, I have learned that dyslexia was not my disability, but rather my invisible gift. My dyslexia challenged me every day, but it was also what made me into an independent thinker, a creative and gave me that hardworking mindset that has taught me to never be discouraged by failure. I realized there are many people out there just like me. So I wanted to learn more about them and dyslexia itself. I realized I needed a way to do this, which was great for dyslexics, which obviously rules out writing anything down and makes total sense why a podcast is perfect. I'm excited to be sharing this journey with you as we learn more about dyslexia, the incredible people that thrive with it, and how we can all transform our greatest challenge into our invisible gift. Welcome to my podcast. Today on The Invisible Gift, I'm joined by Adele Tracy. Adele is one of the most exciting athletes in Britain right now. She's a middle distance runner and was one of the torchbearers for the opening of the 2012 Olympic Games in London. I was so pleased when she agreed to join us on the show. Despite only being 20 minutes apart, we decided to record the podcast remotely because of the global pandemic. We speak about her career, chat about her childhood in Jamaica and what her experience in school was like with dyslexia. We talk about why she became a runner, her makeup business and her plans for the future. But first we kick off with talk about how COVID has impacted her training. Take a listen. Thank you for coming on the podcast. No problem. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about it. So I've been doing loads of research about you. I'm not going to recite it, so don't worry. (laughs) How are you finding COVID? Let's let's ask that question first, because that's a great question to start with. Um, Yeah, it's just been a bit of a an odd time um I feel really really grateful that I've been able to compete I've been competing the last couple of weeks and um still able to do my sports um some capacity even though a lot of things have changed this season obviously there was a Olympic Games this year which has been postponed um but yeah just feeling really kind of one day at a time being in the moment not thinking too far ahead because um yeah, it's just such, such an uncertain time. You wasn't diagnosed with dyslexia uh, until you moved to the UK, is that right? What was your arrangements before you was born in? I was actually born in the US, in the States, and then I moved to, um, I was born in Seattle, and then I, I moved to Jamaica when I was about three or four, and then um, was actually educated in Jamaica until I was like maybe seven or eight. So I went to school there and, um, we didn't know I was dyslexic and I was actually part of a setup. We had, um, my mum actually sat, started a school, um, kind of like a homeschool sort of situation with a lot of kids from our community. So it was very hands-on and we were very like, learning visually. I remember growing sunflowers and measuring them for like maths and stuff like that. So it was like perfect for me. Um, knowing now um how i kind of learn best and then i kind of came to the uk when i was about seven or eight and just realized like how far behind i was like i just had so much anxiety going into classes at school because you know teachers would call you out and ask if you understood something and i literally felt like i wasn't absorbing anything um for a good i would say for a good year or two um no one really picked up on it but I was really lucky to have a um special needs um educational assessor in my school who um actually diagnosed me as dyslexic so I was really lucky to have that diagnosis so early on because as soon as I had that I like finally understood why you know I just didn't necessarily understand things like everybody else did and and why I found certain things challenging um and I think it just gave me the like a real confidence to kind of throw myself into the things that I knew I was good at. And that kind of translated into to my academics, I feel, as well. I'm really interested what you said about learning different styles in different countries. Um, so your the education in Jamaica was very different and more... So I assume it was more kinesthetic because you were actually physically doing most of the things 
you had to learn. Is that is that the case? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I should have grown up in Jamaica. That would have been a better situation for me. <laughs> yeah, um, no, it was amazing. Like just having like I think that visual learning and very hands on and more creative way of learning. Um, I know that I know now that really suits me having gone through like school and a levels and UCSEs and gone on to higher education as well um I know that's how I learn best so it's interesting that I kind of started off that way and then kind of um yeah yeah I've come back to that you're obviously an amazing athlete so congratulations on that um not quite as good as me I'm sure but an amazing athlete um and <laughs> do you do you think that's a product of your dyslexia because for me I I was heavily into martial arts when I was younger. I only stopped about five years ago. And my parents actually put me in martial arts because I was a pain in the ass and they wanted me to release some of my anger. I had probably now, when I look back through not being able to do most of my schoolwork, did you, is your sports an uh, outcome of you? Would you say your learning difficulties? Yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely say that, um, I felt very much at home and comfortable when I was playing sport or when I was being expressing myself creatively. Um, I think particularly at school, like I think it was amazing that a teacher kind of saw that in me and, you know, he was like, Oh, do you want to, do you want to try running club? Um, and I went along to running club and I just felt like I was in my element. Like sports day was my favorite day of the year. Like I felt like, it's it was good to feel good at something um and and that's probably why i've always had it there like all through um growing up in the background athletics has always been there for me and even though i you know was so um i guess as a child like i really really wanted to be an athlete i never actually thought i would be a professional athlete and that you know i could call that my job essentially so i i feel so lucky that you know i've got to a place where um yeah, that my younger self never thought I would be. Um, yeah, and just, just by having that in the background. And I think it was so good for my studies as well. Like, I'm sure you'll find from maybe doing martial arts, like having, you have another level of concentration when you've exercised. And um, I think it's a really great way to kind of channel your energy. It gives you that discipline, that, you know, ability to be more organized, um, which I think really helps with my specific learning difficulties as well. So a makeup artist as well. Yes. <laughs> so, so you again. This is like all the people I'm meeting say the same thing. They're always creative. So you've got you're either very sporty or creative, and you've got both. So, what's the split in your life? Is how much do you, time do you spend on your um, sports side, and how much time do you spend on your makeup artist side? For the time being, like I would very much call myself a full time athlete because there's kind of only a limited period of time where you can apply yourself as an athlete. Mm. Um, I know that, yeah, I want to get the most out of myself and I feel like I'm in a really good position to do that. So I'd say the majority of my time is taken up by being a full-time athlete. I train um, six days a week, um, sometimes three times a day. And yeah, that takes up a lot of my time. But that one rest day, I get a week on a Friday. Um, I quite often do try and fit in something that's going to benefit my makeup career you know it might just be the one-off shoot for the day or it might be working on with one-on-one -on -one with a client or yeah just just whatever I see best or working you know with other creatives working on a project um so I try and do that at least once a week and um that's my way of kind of keeping the, my foot in the door and um hoping that I can kind of come back to that in the future um once I'm um retired <laughs> retired yeah certainly you sound you're far too young to say retired but i know what it is with sports is it's, it's such a short shelf life isn't it sports which is is must be hard yeah i mean i think for me like I, as long as i'm enjoying my sport and my body's healthy and it allows me to perform to the best of my ability you know i'll do it for as long as i possibly can um right now i'm i'm 27 so i'm a, 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 um supposedly in my prime for 800 meter running so i feel really fortunate to be in that place but um yeah i can't see an end in sight at the moment but it's it's something that i 
I just tend to do is, you know, if I'm passionate about something, I think it's important that you can be passionate about more than one thing at the same time. Um, I love makeup and I love being creative. So keeping that there in the background um, means that I can revisit that later on. How was school for you in, let's go to the UK, because we obviously probably have more similar experiences in that area. How was, how did you find dyslexia as a, when you were younger? How was school? Because you being, you're 10 years younger than me, although you look 20 years younger than me, but that's a more of a reflection on how I look than how you look. Obviously, I need to run more, right? Um <laughs> So how was, how was your school life when uh, you were younger, when you come over to the UK? Um, I think I was very shy as a child and, um, yeah, and I think that was probably because I really, really lacked confidence. And um, I think when you have, when you feel at a disadvantage as a child and you don't understand why, then I think that's a natural kind of way to be. And then I... Yeah, I think I think athletic sports really helped me come out of my shell because um, I felt like, yeah, I could um, be good at something in that environment. Um, but yeah, I just found school very hard. Um, a lot of my friends actually were quite academic. So, you know, I would go off to my bottom set for maths and, you know, struggle through and and. Honestly, I mean, I only, I think for GCSEs, um, I think for maths, I, I managed a D and I was so proud of myself for getting that D because That's amazing. I honestly, yeah, I worked so hard and it, yeah, honestly, to, to this day, I still really, really struggle with, with um, anything numerical. Like I can't read a clock, hence why I wear a digital clock on my wrist and um, yeah, that's all I need for athletics. But yeah, just numbers um, are a constant challenge for me. So that was my biggest challenge, I think, at school. And I remember even getting into university, I had to take an adult numeracy um, sort of multiple choice um, exam because I didn't have the required um, grades to, to do to do makeup. So that was another wow. big challenge for me after I'd done my GCSEs and kind of got through that to, to actually get into university. Well, you're extremely well spoken. I, I, I've got an obsession with the way people talk because I, I talk really common. I'm South London commoner um, and I'm used to talking like this. Yeah, everyone I, everyone I speak to who's dyslexic seems to talk so well and I'm like, I think I've missed something here. It's like a, a trait that I don't seem to have got. You must have been in the public eye for a long time. Do you become more uh, conscious about how you talk? Or have you just got really well spoken? No, I think, um, yeah, I just, this is the way I've always spoke. My, I think, you know, when you, my, my mum sounds the same, like, you know, you know, when you have people um, that know you really well, close family, friends, they wouldn't be able to tell if it was my sister, my mom or me on the phone. So I think we just wow. all sound the same. And um, yeah, I, I, I personally have never thought that I'm particularly well spoken or anything. Um, I actually think because my processing sometimes is really a real challenge for me and I can't quite, you know, find the words to say what I want to say sometimes. Um, so I actually feel, feel like um, that's the opposite. So thank you. <laughs> when you're in public with dyslexia, I have this nightmare whenever I'm going to speak to someone, we can do stuff like this because it just feels like we're sitting in a room talking and I, f sat, I, I forget about hopefully hundreds and people listening. I don't think about it. I just think about us. So I don't panic that much. You obviously have to, speak in public um now when i speak if i was to speak in public i would forget all my words and that's not nerves i'm not really a nervous person but i that's always a dyslexia thing it's like when i walk into an exam i just forget everything i've ever learned it's like the page has gone blank do you do you have you had that problem or do you, have you taken quite well to the public speaking oh no i 100 percent have that problem um reading is a real struggle for me particularly in front of people so if I ever had to read something that I planned that just wouldn't work for me I've never actually had to do um or maybe I have but I've kind of brushed under the carpet <laughs> I've never had to, that I can remember speak and read something in front of you know a large audience it's normally a Q&A situation where you know I feel perfectly comfortable doing that because it's like a conversation like we're having now sort of thing um 
if I had to read something and recite something from a piece of paper, I think that would be a real challenge for me. I actually recall um, when I used to work for a uh, retail uh, company um, and the interview process was in a group group situation and they asked me to recite the the story of the founder of the company um, to the room full of people and I just completely froze I was like there is no way I'm going to be able to do this so I, I made up some rubbish excuse about not having my glasses and I think that's what you do oh, as a great dyslexic excuse, or, though. you know you you just think on your feet and you find a way to kind of just curve these situations <laughs> you've just mentioned the superpower of dyslexic people finding a way out of a problem you're that that blaming the glasses is a great way of doing it I'm gonna have to write that down I might use that yeah it's a useful one <laughs> This is my first series of podcasts. And um, the first thing that everyone does is read out, like I would give a description of you and what you've done. And I remember saying to our producers, they said, so this is what we're going to do. And I was like, I can't do that. I can't imagine sitting here going, oh, hey, this is the, and, and you sitting there watching me. That would, that would scare the hell out of me. Um, but yeah. I could. No, I'd be exactly the same. So not, no TED talk in your future. Um, not, not that I can see. No, I'm very much an improviser. Like if somebody said, can you talk about makeup and do a presentation? I would be there with my bullet points and no, no other, like, you know, big text. Cause if I have to read something perfectly to other people, that would really stress me out. But yeah, I'm, I'm very much an improviser. I can talk about things that I, you know, know about, um, but I wouldn't be reading it. Yeah. Yeah. Were you good at drama at school? I did. I did drama A level actually, um, and I actually really enjoyed. I really enjoyed that, um, which is interesting because obviously you have to learn a script. But I think the way there's a lot of. Um, I think there's quite a lot of actors that I've seen that are dyslexic, and I think it's the way that you learn it and you practice, and it's very practical that I found that okay actually. Do you find that your shyness didn't reflect in your drama? drama you used to do no it really didn't um yeah it's interesting you say that because i would i would consider myself to be quite a confident person now but i think it's easy to think that when you think about your younger self maybe because um, it's such a contrast the older we get the better we were that's what i always say yeah yeah <laughs> yeah definitely and i think yeah like you say um i was always a really confident performer um whenever i i would perform for for drama and things like that so um yeah it's strange that that is, you, you could think of a shy person to be that confident in that way what would you say your superpower was when you was at school i know i'm using the superpower i've never used this term before but today i'm obsessed with superpowers so what was your what was the thing you was really good at at school i think a lot of my friends would always think that i was good at a lot of things which which would I felt uncomfortable with you know that 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 phrase or even thinking of myself in that way because for me I was at such a disadvantage when it came to anything academic um that yeah it just didn't compare but I you know I like I used to be in a lot of drama groups outside of school and also in school obviously did that to my a-levels um i did photography a-level i did textiles a-level i did um so it's very arty and i did art as well um and i think that's why like it was a natural thing for me to think even though i'd been running in the background for all through school um that i wanted to do a career in the arts um because a lot of athletes tend to go down the academic route and go to a sort of sports institute for their university of choice because it supports them in kind of getting to that next level to become a professional athlete. Um, so I actually went down a bit of a different route because um, I knew I wasn't going to have that sports set up, um, but it was kind of a commitment to that I was willing to take, I was willing to be committed to my sport and still do that. And, you know, I had to get up at, you know, 5am to go running, to be in university at like 8, 8.30. And then I, it's like a nine to five job almost when you're doing a practical degree because you have to be there for every single class. And my lecturers were very tough on us because industries can be really tough and, you know, they expected you to be there even if you were ill, no, no days off because if you missed 
a day of uni, you'd missed a whole topic. Um, so yeah, it was, it was intensive five days a week and um, doing that with training was really, really tough. So I think um, I had to be, I would say maybe my, I hate calling it superpower, but <laughs> maybe might be my uh, I'm gonna make superpower. you do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> is, is just um, that drive, like just having that drive and knowing exactly what I want um, no matter, no matter what, basically. Yeah. I was hoping that was going to be your superpower <laughs> okay. because that beautifully pushes onto my next question. <laughs> okay, so <great. laughs> did you make a decision? I know you just said you decided you want to be in the uh, creative industry, but did you make a decision quite young that you was going to get into, well, stay in sports and become as well known as you are in the sports arena? I, I've literally wanted to be an athlete um, from about six or seven years old. I remember watching the 2000 Sydney Olympics and just thinking that's exactly what I want to do. I want to be an athlete. I didn't, I didn't think it would happen. I honestly did not think that I would be a professional athlete at all, but I just carried, yeah, I just carried that sort of energy into anything that would get me there um, and joined my local athletics club as soon as I could. Um, yeah, so I honestly did not believe that I would get to this point, but it's what I wanted from day one. Um, and if and if that wasn't going to happen, I, I knew I would be doing something creative because um, I absolutely, my grandma was great at just kind of getting me involved in, in loads of like arts and crafts. We used to do that a lot when I was a kid and she also had an incredible collection of lipsticks that I was just obsessed with. So that kind of yeah really really concrete from you know i knew i wanted to do something creative and i wanted to run being dyslexic obviously has its issues with management i think it does for me i can't organize anything i've got amazing people um and my my pa is probably runs all my businesses which is great and my partner she does everything else that involves organization and i sit here and take all the credit which is really lovely for me i was so impressed by adele's commitment i don't know if athletes are born with that kind of mindset or develop it with their sport but i'm totally unsurprised by how positive and adaptable she is with her dyslexia adele and i continued chatting about her training her use of social media and i was keen to learn more about how she builds her personal brand but on the other side of it, you've got your personal brand and all the other aspects that go with being a professional athlete, which is interviews and all the other things you've got to do. Do you manage that all yourself? And how do you find that with your dyslexia? Is there restrictions there or have you had to adapt a lot or do you have a team around you? It's a big question. I definitely have help. I think every, you know, every, you know, person with dyslexia needs support. And I have an amazing team around me that helps me achieve everything. <laughs> um, probably my mum from day one um, has been that person to kind of just filter um, some of the stuff that comes with um, being an athlete and trying to study and trying to be just a person um, mm. away. And she's, she's really helped me gradually take on that as I've gotten older, because um, I think I would have been really overwhelmed to do, you know, all the entering races and emails and admin that goes with um you know all that stuff so she was great at kind of diffusing that and she's you know been amazing for my sister as well who's um dyscalculic as well and she's dyspractic and my younger brother also also has autism so we have a lot of neurodiversities in our family so my mum is amazing at just kind of helping us manage that sort of stuff and i would say um i also have someone who does my races now so I have an agent who does that mm -hmm. um but I do manage um a lot of you know say my social media and that sort of stuff myself and mm. any work that I get as a makeup artist I also manage so it is just almost being over organized um mm. I have a very um clear routine for every single day I put notes in my diary for each kind of thing that I'm doing that day just because I know that it's going to take me a little bit longer than the average person to kind of muddle through all of that stuff. So if it's very clear and it's all written down on paper, then um, I find it just makes things a lot easier. <laughs> so you said you get up at five. You used to get up at five. Do you still get up at five? I don't. No, I don't get up at five anymore. <laughs> That's when I was studying and I was having to train around that and, and also working. But um, 
if, if I was work doing a makeup job, yeah, I'd be up at that time running because um, I normally have to be on set about seven. You have mm. to be the first person there and the first, last person to leave. So, yeah. yeah, it's a lot. It's a long day. So what time do you get up now? Um, this is, there's going to be a question leading onto this because it's always, there's always saying about time with dyslexic people. Yeah, I, I probably get up at about eight o'clock every day. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, That's which the- is really, really, yeah, I'm really, really lucky that I'm able to do that because I normally start my training for the day about half nine. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'm really lucky unless I'm doing a makeup job and I'm up at, you know, 5 a.m. sometimes earlier. Um 8 a.m. is is yeah i like a good you know nine ten hours of sleep like for being uh, an athlete you ha- you need that so sleep and also just for organization as well that's what i was gonna say um i i was gonna see if there was a difference for i assumed because if i even go if when i go to the gym if i have a really hard session i need to sleep mm-hmm. more and eat more but um i can't imagine yeah. it must be intense being a professional athlete and try and get that sleep in yeah for, as an athlete recovery is really important but also i just think it gives me that clarity that i need um being you know someone who's had specific learning difficulties to to get through the day and and have a productive day and try and tackle all those challenges that you encounter it's brilliant so dyslexia do you find that it makes much difference in your adult life compared to your childhood what sort of areas of your life does it to affect it is that like sort of daily um admin thing like little tasks that i think some people would find maybe quite easy um are a real challenge like you know just making sure that i'm being organized so that i don't forget things i can feel quite overwhelmed by um too many emails or you know um too many jobs in between the things that i know i have to do um things just take me a bit longer i think it's that processing time as well um so i would say that how i feel now being out of education as a dyslexic is very different to how I used to feel, but I'd say the challenges are still there. Um, They're just in different ways. Um, I mean, spelling is a constant battle for me. Like, I think that's why I find emails quite stressful because every time I send one, I'm having to like check if everything's spelled right. And you probably know yourself as a dyslexic, quite often you can't even recognize if something was spelled wrong. Um, So yeah, it's just just checking and I I have um, great people around me to kind of, you know, proofread stuff and um, help me out regularly. But yeah, I think that is like a constant kind of challenge. You said you do your own social media. The one thing I found, I don't, I try and avoid posting stuff on social media because I started doing it and I made so many mistakes. I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. Um, do you? And people how, like to point it out as well. I know. Which is, is, yeah. Um, I, I don't do Twitter very well because of that because you can't edit a tweet you can edit on instagram See, i didn't even and, know that <laughs> yeah, yeah. and facebook so i'm quite happy to do instagram because again it's more visual more creative but i can edit things so people people won't see my spelling mistakes <laughs> i always get a message saying you've got to take that down you spelt this wrong or you've put the wrong word in here or something like that and I, i'm like and the more the more public facing i become i suppose there's a lot more criticism and you must if you post something wrong i suppose you get it a lot harder than i would yeah maybe i don't know i think um i think the best thing is being honesty is the best policy and i think people um find it really endearing if you are honest if you just say you know i think that is also how you get through these awkward situations is laughing off and being like you know i'm really dyslexic (laughs) so yeah i will make mistakes and just being human um is probably the easiest way to tackle those things but do you not find that this this is yeah, it's funny I, I had this i had this conversation with angie lamar when she was on the podcast and she said um the same thing it's like but even if you say you're dyslexic these days people don't see that as a you know if you if you said i'm autistic as an example people go oh shouldn't have said that should have been more careful but when you when you when someone hammers you for spelling something wrong do you not find it's they're they're less they don't really care that you're dyslexic yeah yeah no i know what you mean like a different guess different universities like carry certain weight to 
you know, people interpret them differently. So, um, yeah, no, I agree with you there for sure. Um, but I think it's just having that confidence to know, um, yeah, know yourself and be confident to say. I think something that's really helped is obviously being an ambassador for the British Dyslexic Association. I think um, they have some really useful kind of knowledge and and help with different situations and and being honest with in the workplace and friends and I think the more you do it the more people can understand and even explaining what you find challenging sometimes makes people realize what dyslexic is for you because it's different for every single dyslexic <laughs> yeah yeah I've I've come to realize that more I've got there I've had my eyes open I thought I knew what dyslexic people were like and I knew nothing it's the, <laughs> the different dyslexics out there. Uh, one of my guests I've had on was she was so um, academic, and I was like, "Wow, I never thought I'd meet such." A, and she was like, "I work my ass off to be this academic," and I was like, "I get it." But she she does all these things, and it, I just assumed a lot of people were very like me. And the first three people I uh, spoke to on the podcast were exactly like me, and it confirmed. Um, confirmed what i thought and then ever since then no one's been like me what age do people retire then in sports in what you do i think it's different for every athlete i think it really depends on like how healthy your body is if you're still enjoying the sport um because i mean i've already been doing this sport if you say i've started running when i was seven years old i've been doing this sport for 20 years um and it's a long journey it's a long process um but I, I'm still loving it and I absolutely, yeah, I feel so lucky that I'm able to do something that I enjoy for my job. Um, but I would say like, you know, for women, it just depends on your situation and how long you want to keep going. Um, I hope that I'll still be going well into my 30s. Um, but yeah, it just depends on, on circumstances for sure. So you you said you're an ambassador for the, the Sex Association. Uh, mm -hmm. What does that entail? Because I haven't got a clue. Basically, British Dyslexic Association's kind of overall goal is to get um, specialist teaching assessors in every school in the UK. So I didn't realise this, but about 80% of dyslexics leave school without a diagnosis. So they, you know, would get, you know, if they didn't go to higher education, they'd probably never find out that they were dyslexic. And I just feel I was so, so lucky to have found myself in a school um, you know, in a, in a state school, I didn't go to a private school or anything like that, um, that had a specialist teaching assessor to be diagnosed at a young age. And then later on, I've also found out I was dyscalculic. Um, I was so, so lucky to have that. So that I'm means... In, I'm impressed how you say that that every time. Do you know, I've never even heard that word before. And every time you say it, I'm like, what? What was that? <laughs> God. It's, it's, it's a real challenge, especially, yeah, for anyone. Well, I thought dyslexic dyslexic. <laughs> word was hard, but I, don't, I still can't say it. It's, it's incredible it every time. It's easier. <laughs> <laughs> like, should. Yeah, so basically um, being part of BDA um, just means that I'm able to kind of help them with that overall goal. I'm able to speak to other young dyslexics. I did an amazing webinar um, back in lockdown with some parents and, and kids that have just recently been thrust into that situation of having to, you know, learn from home and all that, you know, all the challenges that came with lockdown. And it was great to just speak and answer the kids' questions and the parents' questions. And I think it just helps to talk about these things. So, you know, if I can be a part of that in any small way, then, um, yeah, that's really rewarding for me. What has amazed me about this podcast is how willing and open people with dyslexia are about talking about their experiences and also their ongoing desire to help other people who experience the same. I feel like Adele is so generous with her time and energy. I was keen to hear her thoughts on how schools can support people with dyslexia and her goals for the future. Also, I was keen to find out whether she felt dyslexic children lean more towards sports than other activities. So do you think sports is a good outlet for uh, children to, with dyslexia? Because I don't know about you, but I was always very frustrated at school because I felt like I was falling so far behind everyone else. Um, and as I said, sports was a really good outlet for me. Do you, is it something that you kind of advocate with um, 
children. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I think sport is amazing for you know anyone who's who's at school because you know we all have to revise for exams and but particularly for dyslexic because it, like you say it is like just kind of that time to de-stress a little bit and have a bit of fun let off a bit of excess energy and then you come back to your work and you feel so much more focused and refreshed that's always how I felt whenever I would go for a run you know if I was really just bogged down with work and stressed you know as soon as I came back from training I'd feel ready to to go again and, and learn and and really apply myself so I think sports for great for that but also being dyslexic is quite often you do have you know other neurodiversities that come with that like obviously I'm dyscalculic my younger brother is dyslexic he's autistic he's Asperger's so they they all interlock in some way and it's one big spectrum so quite often um you know a lot of dyslexics will have attention um difficulties and a great a great way to kind of you know counteract that is by getting rid of some of that extra energy so sport is great for that well i've recently found out since doing the podcast that i actually have adhd as well um apparently that's why i'm able to run five businesses didn't know that um because <laughs> that's great. it's so chaotic and this is one thing <laughs> i love about speaking to dyslexic people and experts who aren't dyslexic that i when i if someone told me eight months ago that I had ADHD, I'd be like, oh crap, that's not another guy, that's not saying I want. But one of the people I interviewed said, well, if you've got ADHD you're a dump and you run multiple businesses or you do multiple things, that's like another superpower. Um, and it is, I've just now realized why I'm able to run so many different areas. Now, I haven't got officially tested yet, and I'm not, I'm not going to bother if I'm honest, but. Um, it's it's quite funny that it kind of um it kind of all fits together so it's interesting i didn't know that all these interlink and you saying that your brother has autism and things like that it's it's really interesting how many people i'm speaking to have not just dyslexia but all these other well i say conditions can't stand that word all these other um potential successes there you go. That's a better yeah, way of looking at it. Definitely. Yeah. I think that's the thing. And it's so nice that you can kind of see that as a real strength for what you do. And I think you can appreciate that as an adult. Like you're saying, you don't need a test to tell you this about yourself. You know that that's something that, um, you know, has come naturally to you and, and you've been able to kind of capitalize on essentially. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And we all love capitalizing on it. So the, um, what would, how do you think schools obviously you speak to young children for your work how do you think education is doing now with dyslexic people um and seeing as you're also creative the other question on bolt on to that is creatives is pushed quite far back in the order of priorities in school sports and creatives fall quite heavily down the list whereas it's always english and mathematics how do you think schools are doing now or do you think the best thing schools can do to try and adapt to this new wave of more creative people coming through because our world has changed so much? Oh gosh, it's so hard. Um, I mean, I'm sure schools have changed a lot since I was at school, but I, I mean, I don't know enough about what they actually do in class and yeah, kind of how, you know, um, children with special educational needs are kind of um yeah helped but I know for me um, my mum worked so hard to like get me involved in things outside of school that really helped me in school and if that if I hadn't had that I don't think I would have been able to kind of take those creative and uh, kind of things that I enjoyed all my sports the next level um so I guess if schools could you know offer offer more of those clubs and offer more support for those extra activities um then that would be a great way if it's something that they can't put into the curriculum to kind of you know support creatives and sports people then if they can do it after school you know the more activities there are the more likely people are you know gonna get confidence from that explore that further and and potentially want to pursue that as a career later on 
um, you know, I literally, I, I used to do uh, karate as well. I did, um, I was part of a theater group. I used to have singing lessons. I did wow. horse riding. <laughs> like literally my mum would make me do everything. And, you know, I might not have done them for a long period of time, but it just gave me the confidence that I needed to kind of come to school and actually feel, okay, yeah, I'm good at things. Even if I'm not, you know, I'm finding this really hard today. I'm still good at things. Yeah. The one thing I keep seeing come through this is great parents. Now your mum sounds amazing. And I think that's something I, my, my parents done something slightly different. In fact, they was the opposite. So, um, it always, when I explain this, it always sounds like I'm going to about to slag off my parents and I'm truly not, <laughs> but, um, my family, uh, are probably the most unsupportive people in the world. Cause they're so laid back. Right. And so, if I said to them, I'm going to go do this, they go, you go do that. And that would be it. Right. And there would be no, no expectations to do anything. But I said, what's really funny is I learned from a very young age that I have to do everything for myself and achieve. And I think great parents make a massive difference for dyslexic people. Whereas, yeah. um, I speak to some people who haven't done well, haven't done as well in life and their parents worried about dyslexia they put negative connotations around dyslexia no that's a really good point yeah i think i think great parents really help um you need that support and just having that willing to understand what your needs are as well is is so important what's your goals over the next 12 months as as long as the global pandemic uh, allows <laughs> um, <laughs> the next big goal is is the tokyo olympics next year and and there's also world championships next year there are world and european indoors um which is kind of indoor athletics um and yeah and and kind of going into the following year um there'll be more championships to hopefully attack so i'm, I'm excited and um i think having goals on the horizon is a really exciting thing that just makes you push yourself more as well i'm sure you find the same yeah uh I am. I don't know about you. I'll, I'll ask this question: Are you stubborn? If people tell you you can't do something, <laughs> do you just go screw it? I could do anything. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I think maybe that is something that you get from you get that the resilience. You know, if 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 you have those challenges a lot more frequently, which you will if you're someone with dyslexia, um, you get that resilience, and I think you get that fire as well. So yeah, a hundred percent have that. <laughs> I'm very stubborn. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, I find that's a trait as well. I, I say it's because as when you're dyslexic, you fail so much, you become good at failing. Um, yeah, and I think you're not afraid of it. I think no. you're not afraid. So that definitely translates I, I, into your character, essentially. I think a lot of people get caught up on other people's opinions, but I looked so silly or stupid at school so often when I'm trying to read out... Um, words in front of class members and stuff like that and you go through so many years of that that failure is irrelevant it's it's just something that happens and it's easy and the best thing about failure is you learn and move on so quickly and get better and i suppose you've got you can do that doubly because you've got dyslexia but then you've got sports which when you when you and i use the term fail in, not in a negative term i always say you fail forward but you fail so publicly and when I say fail, again, people, your failure is most people's idea of success. And that's what I think that must be really impressive for you. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, you're so right. You get comfortable with being uncomfortable, 100%. Beautiful way of saying it. <laughs> that, 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 you should, you're going to have to write that down. That needs to go, you need to tweet that out right now. <laughs> Just get someone, get someone to check it first. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> so... What advice would you give to anyone? And I, I know you used to say kids or parents of kids with dyslexia, but now I'm just saying any age, what's your, what is your golden nugget you can give someone that's um, either got dyslexia or have a child with dyslexia about life generally? What would you say to them if they're listening? I think I would say believe in yourself don't see dyslexia as a barrier see it as a strength because there are so many amazing things that you can do um and it is 
it is a superpower I think like you said um you know I feel I feel strange saying it out loud as well but it is your superpower because you think in a completely different way to anybody else and um yeah I think remembering that and believing in yourself is so important because I think if I had the confidence now that I did as a kid um I'd be so interested to know you know if I would have been more confident as a child as well so um yeah I think believing in yourself is key so this is this podcast is called the invisible gift what is your invisible gift I think it is that drive because because I always I almost don't know where it comes from and people will ask me um you know what motivates you what what gets you out of bed in the morning I don't know I just I just have that drive and I it doesn't matter what happens if I've got a goal I want to get it <laughs> so where can people find you if they want to follow you or chat to you or I'm actually competing next week I think they're showing it on the BBC I'm racing in Doha Diamond League um so if you want to watch that you can watch that um i'm probably easiest to find on um social media on instagram just adele tracy and then my mm -hmm. twitter is adele underscore tracy but i don't tweet as often as i've already explained why <laughs> so i'm better on instagram <laughs> thank you very much for coming on it's been great speaking to you yeah i know it's been great to chat and yeah just hear about your experiences as well so thank you for having me on and good luck next week. I'm sure you'll smash it like you do everything. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you so much. I'm so impressed by how humbled and assured Adele is. That drive for success and constant self-improvement is so important in life. And I definitely believe her dyslexia has given her that never give up attitude, which you can see in everything she's achieving. Adele, thank you so much for taking a break from your training to join me on the show. And best of luck in your competition next week. We'll be keeping an eye out for you in Tokyo. On the podcast next week, John Holloway. John is a wildly successful and talented photographer. He's going to share his story with me about his neurodiversity project, and I'm going to uncover how he uses his invisible gift of dyslexia to excel in his work. That podcast is coming next week. I know it's one you guys are going to love. Make sure you hit that subscribe button on the podcast app so you're notified when it's released. Just a couple of quick notes before we go. They're important ones. First off, make sure to subscribe to The Invisible Gift wherever you listen to podcasts so you can automatically be notified about new episodes. One thing that's really important to me is to hear what you guys think about the podcast. I want to hear more about the challenges you're facing, what you're trying to change in your own life, work and family, and hear your inspiring stories of how you've overcome the odds to achieve the incredible. I know because so many of you are dyslexic that asking you to write something to me is not going to work. So I've worked with the production team on The Invisible Gift and we've come up with an idea. Grab your phone and record us a voice note. If you've got an iPhone, use voice memos. On Android, the options are endless. Once you're happy with your message, you can email it to me. My email address is andrew at theinvisiblegift.com. I would love to start sharing some of your audio notes and stories in future episodes. Also, and I'm really excited about this, head to theinvisiblegift.com because that way you can see the amazing artwork that has been commissioned to go along with each episode this season and also find out more about each of the guests I've had the pleasure of speaking to on the podcast. If all of this is way too much for you, I get it. I'm starting a newsletter that includes all this and more and it will come straight to your inbox. It's so simple to sign up at theinvisiblegift.com. You've been listening to the Invisible Gift podcast presented by me, Andrew Kitley, and produced by One Fine Play. This episode was recorded by Kazra. From One Fine Play, James Bishop is the executive producer. Kazra is the audio and visual engineer. Connor Foley is the editorial producer and researcher. Special thanks to Christina, Izzy, and the Cube Studios. Thank you for listening to the Invisible Gift podcast. Thank you.